You could sit there and say, I'm wealthy, I'm, I'm attracting love, I'm attracting all the money, and you could say this for hours on end every single day and find yourself nowhere closer to where you wanna be, right. to a higher expression of ourselves, a new version of ourselves. It always means that we need to let go of certain layers or certain things within our, our, our fields or structures that we're a part of. You still don't wanna do this thing. You still cannot show up this way. It's probably not for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kat, can you tell me about your story as far as I mean, your journey, I know you were an entrepreneur, you are still an entrepreneur, obviously, but with Age Loop and like the whole story, um, can you tell the listeners a bit more about yourself who hasn't heard of you and also your journey plus money involved? Like, I want to tie both of that together. Do you mind sharing that with the listeners first? Yeah. How far back do you want me to go? <laughs> I was born. <laughs> no, it was a windy day. I, I don't know. Born. <laughs> no, yeah, no. sure. So I'll start with kind of my upbringing around money. I was, I never grew up with money. Both my parents worked really, really hard. Over time, we were always hanging out, loitering in my parents' offices late at night. This was back in the 80s when, pe when parents used to li leave kids home alone as well when they were young. So we would be at home alone all the time. And Always I kept hearing this ethos, you got to work really, really hard to be successful. You got to be connected. You got to have, you know, a good job, uh, have really good grades, be really lucky, essentially. But what I observed from a really young age was my parents were some of the hardest working people I'd ever known. And we never had any money. And my, I always felt the financial anxiety in the household. Every time a bill would come in, my father would always say that he never had any money. And we, we lived in some you know, big apartment blocks that were pretty dingy, always sharing a room. We slept in my mom's bed, all of us. So I was pretty determined from a young age to find my own success because I, I realized that that sort of anxiety around money was not something that I wanted to have for myself growing up. But I, the whole ethos of hustle and work hard was so ingrained in me, not only by my parents, but society as a whole. And when I went off to find success, at first I thought I was going to be a supermodel and that I was going to end up on the covers of Vogue like a lot of 14-year-old girls do. So I left home when I was 14, left high school, decided I was going to find a modeling agency. I found one. I went to hundreds of auditions, would land like a couple gigs, some of them with some pretty decent brands, but they would pay in contra, like clothing or handbags, which was awesome, but didn't pay my bills. So consequently, I ended up in the erotic industry as a stripper, an underage stripper. And that whole industry reinforced hustling because it was like glorified in there. You know, the more you hustle, the more you make. I'm a hustler. And eventually, uh, as, my, as I got older, I left that industry. My ex-husband didn't want me to be a dancer anymore. Decided to go back to high school, finish my GED, went to university, Got a nine to five job. That was my big dream. I was like, oh, I'm going to get a paycheck every week and I'm going to be successful and I'll rise to the top. And really quickly, within a matter of a year or two, I realized, oh my God, this is not what it's cracked out to be. You only get your weekends, you're in traffic all the time. And I was surrounded by a lot of entrepreneurs at the time. So that inspired me to go out and do my own thing. Uh, my first business was an absolute failure. It cost me $40,000. I face planted really badly. And then from there, however, I got into the world of social media, Facebook. Back then it was like Facebook likes and getting comments on pages. It was really new, the ad space. And it, it did well in terms of I was able to sustain myself, but I was 
always working, always burned out, always overwhelmed. So my relationship with money for the majority of my life was extremely sacrificial. It was based off, I give my time or I give uh, time away from people that I love in exchange to make money, like many of us are. And that continued as my business began to explode and, and do really well. I found myself in a stage after about seven years where I, my nervous system was just shot and I was just so burnt out. And I think maybe you saw that whole thing unfold as well online. I had a total mental breakdown in 2020, walked away from the business. This was a multi-million dollar company at that time. And it was then that I decided to reevaluate my relationship with money and how I wanted to receive this essentially imagined resource in my life. So that's kind of been the, the journey up until where I am now, where money for me now is something that is earned through flow, through play, through my own resonance, my own frequency. That is what I prioritize. I now understand that it is a human construct. It doesn't actually exist. It's an imagined thing. So I am money, you are money, you are all the money that you want, there's no separation. And when we begin to create and operate from that level, it's a completely different way of creating in our life. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I think what I wanted to like take this conversation further without you giving away the farm because you already started to give out, you know, all the nuggets about obviously money and how it's like um, as a construct, right? What are the beliefs that you think that most of us have, like flawed belief of money, besides that it has to be hard? Like what are the other things that you noticed in, within yourself or other people? So I think the most insidious one, the one that prevents the most people from receiving money is the one where it's bad or it's evil or it's something that's really difficult or a big problem of our society. And because money is essentially imagined, it's a human construct, it doesn't exist, the financial circumstances that we find ourselves in are always a reflection of our own beliefs. So the belief that it's evil or it's bad or it's what represents everything wrong in the world or rich people are, are you know, greedy out to, to get everybody will inadvertently prevent people from receiving because you're not going to allow yourself to receive something that is inherently against your values. I think that's the big one. And then next to that one, it's the hustle, especially amongst entrepreneurs and, and artists and creatives the you got to sacrifice you know you got to go through this hero's journey to be able to say i did it i'm deserving of this thing look i i lost all my hair and i have wrinkles now and now i can receive this thing that one was really hard for me to shift so even when i overcame the whole money is evil i get to receive it's it's you know it's abundant there's more than enough for everybody I was still addicted to the hustle mentality. So even when I walked away from my company and I was essentially in a mini retirement for a year, I constantly felt guilty for not being busy, like always like going through to-do lists or always bringing this kind of like frenetic energy to things that I was created. I felt guilty. I felt lazy. I felt like I didn't deserve to receive because I wasn't burning myself out to the ground. And I see that one a lot in the entrepreneurial space, big time. Mm -hmm. How do you, I think you mentioned in the book as well um, about seasons, about how you allow yourself to rest and replenish, you know, in different seasons in your business, right? Can you tell us a bit more about that? The hustling versus the taking back and just relaxing. And how did you, managed to overcome the hustle and just be okay with not going so hard all the time. Yeah, so one of the things that I don't think they teach us very well in the in schools or the school of life or entrepreneurial programs or when you're going into business or if you're an artist, a creative, it's the same thing. If you look at nature, every 
process observes a rest and re recovery cycle. You know, even the seasons, right? And I, I heard someone say once where they injected adrenaline into trees in autumn so that they wouldn't go into hibernation and so that they would continue to flower and bloom and grow. And what happened was these trees that normally grow for 300, 400 years died within a year. So everything needs, every process of growth observes a rest and recovery cycle and rest and recovery precedes growth and transformation. But we live in a society where we measure ourselves by gross domestic productivity, which is like produce, produce, work, 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 work. We have these five day work weeks, which is kind of insane actually. And everything is like how you, how much you work, how much you apply. And there's no space for this rest and recovery. And I really believe that that's one of the reasons why, especially Americans, because Americans are very into this kind of hustle narrative. I, I really believe that's one of the reasons why the life expectancy rate is going down in America for the first time in a century why depression rates are on the rise, why all of these things are happening. Because we're not honoring these rest and recovery cycles that we used to honor back in ancient times just because of the seasons, right? Winter would come and farming would essentially stop and you'd go into a rest cycle. Now we're on 24 seven all the time. So it's really important if you're facing a moment where you are disconnected with purpose, you don't have clarity, maybe you have low energy, you don't have the same kind of stamina. The first thing is to just not chastise yourself for it and not feel guilty for it. And to understand that because rest and recovery precedes growth, it is because it's so vital to growth and transformation, you still get to receive even in that cycle, especially in that cycle. That was something that I recently came into this kind of awareness in my own life where I had a, a difficult breakup with my partner. I was sort of like a couch potato for weeks on end. I just didn't even move from the couch. I didn't do anything. And my mind was like, oh my God, Kat, you're going to go bankrupt. What are you doing? This is really bad. You know, I was really like belittling myself and feeling really guilty about the whole thing. And then I, I, re I realized this about rest and recovery. And I realized how every expansion I've ever had in my businesses and in my life always followed the, this kind of cycle. And I, I said to myself, you know what, I'm just going to play with the idea that I still get to receive in this phase. I still get to receive even when I'm a couch potato, even when I'm lacking purpose, even when I'm sad and heartbroken. And my revenues were up 20% that month. And I was doing nothing. Literally, I, I was doing nothing. Like I was not sending emails. I was, I didn't even post on social media the whole month. So that was a huge eye opener for me to be like, holy crap, money does not actually even care if you're in a productivity or connected to purpose or if you're hustling or doing things. It has nothing to do with that. Rather, it's the stories we tell ourselves about those phases and how we guilt ourselves and then we prevent ourselves from receiving. So it's not easy to disconnect from that because that is a program that most of us have been living and embodying for our entire lives. And it takes a lot of intentionality, as in every single day you must prioritize your own resonance, your own space of well being, reconnecting with affinity to money, allowing yourself to receive, playing with this new paradigm that you still get to be looked after, even when you're in the cycle in your life. Uh, but you have to be really intentional about it for sure. Yeah. Um, and you talk about your partner a lot in the book, and I'm so sorry that you're no longer together. Um, but there were a couple of things I wanted to like touch on. And thank you so much for explaining the abs and like abs and flows and how we can allow them ourselves to, to receive, even though we're not doing anything. 
Um, the first thing I wanted to touch on with your partner is how his view of money um, sometimes not infected your views of money, but like he had a different view than you do. Like how do we, especially in our environment, in our relationships, like how do we keep our own resonance, our own belief that we try to cultivate, okay? We are trying to override the old ones. When everyone around us is telling us that, no, that's not how it works. I know because they have their own beliefs. Like how do we manage to hold our own resonance? You know? Yeah, great question. So my partner comes from Uruguay, which is um, sort of a socialist country, and money is very much seen as something bad or evil, and they don't have a lot of money over there. So very different mindset to where I was at. And it definitely affected me big time. What I will say is that when you're not in your own alignment, when you're not creating, following your own greens, when you're not prioritizing your energy, it's very easy to slip into the paradigms of other people, which is what happened to me. So I'm I'm not blaming him at all. In fact, I know that I attracted that whole situation to bring me to the space of finding my own hand, finding my own frequency once more, but it definitely affected me. And so if you have a partner, it, I mean, it's one thing if it's like your mom or your dad and you can, you, you probably don't live with them anymore. So you can kind of minimize the time you spend around friends you know, there's a lot less entanglement with friendships where you can minimize the time you spend with them. And usually that's enough to be able to hold your own space and be like, you know, it's water off a duck's back. People will tell you stuff and it just bounces off. Okay. But when it's your partner and you're living with them, you know, every day, there's a lot of entanglement there. It does become a little bit trickier. And for me in my own situation, it was uh, definitely, a, it came to a place where I realized I needed to prioritize my own energy and my own frequency, and I couldn't do it with this person around me. So I had to foster a lot of courage in my life to be able to untangle that came with a lot of chaos in itself, as it always does when we're shifting and, and pivoting and transforming things. So I'm not saying you have to cut off everybody in your life who has bad money beliefs. I think if you're not really steadfast in your own frequency and your own beliefs, then, then usually it's a good idea to at least remove yourself. It doesn't have to be forever, but just until you really, really are secure in your own narrative and then Usually you're around those people and it doesn't affect you as much. And gradually what will happen, the more you stay steadfast to your own, is those people will come on board, most of them. They'll, they'll, you'll lift them up instead of you going to that level. But if you're finding that you're really, really struggling to hold your own belief systems, your own narrative around money, then usually we have to align the divine masculine, our actions, our behaviors, our words, to the intentions that we have to ourselves, And that often means that we need to set boundaries, we need to untangle ourselves from certain people. It's not easy to do that. That's why I talk about courage a lot in my book and finding that vibration of play so that you can find that courage to do those types of things. But it was like night and day for me when I made that decision. My, I mean, if you had spoken to me even just three, four months ago, my energy was just like, oof. you know, I was just really like downtone, monotone. And then when I made that move, yes, I went through like three, four weeks where I was like heartbroken and depressed and woomy and sorry. But once I caught myself and I shifted, you know, my priorities around my resonance and my frequency, 
It was like night and day. Everything just blossomed. I reconnected with purpose. I reconnected with clarity. My bank account started to blossom even more and more and more and more. So, and, and I cannot be the one to say to you, like, you need to leave this person or you need to walk away. That is only something that you will be able to discern for yourself. And it's really based off your own your own signal, like tuning in. Can I, can I hold this space around these people? Yes or no? No. My recommendation is disconnect if you can in some way. Uh, there's a reason we say you are the five people you hang around with the most, right? If your friends are in deep scarcity or they're always complaining about money, it's going to be very, very hard for you to feel affinity towards money, to feel like you can believe that this is possible. If you're hanging around people that are always complaining about the economy or governments or recessions or these kinds of things, it's going to be very, very hard for you to believe that you can attract bigger sums of money so that is up for you to discern but when you're really aligned usually those conversations d don't affect you and you d you attract them less like people don't even bring that stuff up to you anymore but if you're not in integrity in your own life meaning you're not embodying the actions behaviors the words the language that matches your intentions and desires Yes, it'll be easy for you to fall into other people's narratives. Mm. I love that. When you were talking about this, the word courage came up to me. And I found what you did incredibly courageous from walking away from your business, million dollar business, to starting a new business claiming yourself, you know, as a witch, you know, that takes incredible courage. Can you tell us how was the process for you to finally step into that true version of yourself that you've been hiding for so long? Yeah, so <laughs> walking away from my business was not courage. I didn't, <laughs> and, and because I never transmuted courage, that lesson came up again for me recently in my life because when we are trying to calibrate to a higher expression of ourselves, a new version of ourselves, it always means that we need to let go of certain layers or certain things within our, our, our fields or structures that we're a part of. There's always going to be things within the structures or circumstances that we're in that we're going to have to release and let go of. In 2022, I walked away only because I was about to kill myself. And it became very clear that if I didn't do that, I was going to die. So it wasn't so much courage, I would say, as just a total rock bottom where I was like, There's, this, is my, this is my last kind of ditch effort. And likewise, when I came out of a witch as a witch, yes, there was a lot of courage there, but I was also in a really difficult time, chaotic time in my life. I was kind of like up against the corner. And so what's happened because of that is the lesson of transmuting courage came up again in my life. So I'm aspiring to become this higher version of myself, this bigger version receiving at a new level, which requires the version of myself that receives at that level. She's very courageous. She's very steadfast in her views and so because I didn't transmute that in 2020, the, and chaos had to step in to do it for me, which is what happens. Every time you desire for something big, you engage the divine feminine through affirmations, journaling, intentions, rituals. It doesn't matter. You're like, universe, bring me this. And the universe is like, done. I'm bringing it. But hey, these things here, like you're still acting and behaving and allowing these structures to exist and they're not going to allow that to be received. You need to let those go. No, I'm too scared. I can't. I, you know, the, the, there's too much anxiety. What if I don't make the money? What if, how am I going to pay the bills? Whenever you engage the divine feminine in that way and you don't align your actions and behaviors, chaos is going to come in to do it for you, which is totally what happened to me in 2020. 
I knew I wanted to talk about something else. I knew I was done talking about Facebook ads, but I was too scared to walk away and pivot my business and shift. So my the chaos that showed up was my mental health, which is the easiest form of chaos for us to create. The easiest form of chaos for us to create is through money because it's imagined. So usually if your revenues are plateauing or going down, pay attention because what you're doing is you're using chaos as a mechanism of catalyst in your life. And then mental health is also very easy for us to create chaos through. So that's what happened to me, both of those things. And so I, in 2022, I was going to a new level. I was like, I'm going to go to this next bracket and receive freedom on a totally different uh, level that I've never experienced before. But I still had those, like I'd never transmuted courage properly, if that makes sense, because that had been chaos that had done it for me last time. So the lesson came up again and some chaos started to show up again in my life. And And a big part of that chaos was my relationship. And so that was like a a huge thing for me to like self-source courage and go, "Uh, I learned my lesson last time. Like I know chaos is a really messy way to go about it. I have a choice now. I can either step into the unknown, face my fears and just trust myself. Or I can continue to desire these big things and let my world fall apart in the most messy of ways that is really painful way to go about it. And that's when I transmuted the chaos to leave the relationship. I pivoted my business big time. At the time, I was uh, following this business structure that my mentor had that worked really well for her. It was it was not for me. And even though I kind of knew that in my heart, I was like, no, but you know, you sold people into this and now you got to like, just do it. Otherwise you're going to let people down and people are going to think you're crazy. You're shifting and pivoting again and no one's going to want to trust you. Consistency cat. And all this like voice of rational, you know, my rational voice in my head. And I had to self source the courage and go, no, this is like, I already learned this lesson. I cannot go down that road again. I know what's going to happen to my money. I know what's going to happen to my mental health if I, if I don't find the courage to do that. So the ways that I found courage in my life was I did simple things first. Like I picked up a chainsaw, which was like, uh, there's a tree that fell down in my backyard and it, it meant a lot to me, this tree. Uh, it was the reason I bought this property, this big willow tree. And I was going to get an arborist to come in and chop it up. But then I was like, my intuition was like, no, you need to cut it up. And, and you need to go through this journey with this tree. Wow. So it's like, I'm going to learn how to use a chainsaw. Something that may not be scary for some people listening. But to me, that was like, what the, I'm going to lose a leg here. Even my ex was like, this is so dumb. Why are you doing it? Everyone in my life was like, cat, like, be careful. Like you're going to hurt yourself. But it was like perfect because it required an amount of courage for me to use this big, powerful thing. And I started to tap into this vibration and then it started to overspill in other areas of my life. And I was able to face those bigger things with a lot more ease, with a lot less anxiety, trusting myself through those unknowns. That is the vibration of play, courage. So if you're, fa- if you're in deep anxiety and deep fear right now, and you're facing uh, structures in your life that you're too scared to change or pattern interrupt or shift or walk away from, go and seek out courage in small ways in, in, in your life. So go do things that make you a little bit uncomfortable, like a, a new dance lesson or go say, give a compliment to a stranger on the street, right? And those little doses of courage will build up and gradually like you'll be able to tap into that vibration a lot easier and it will serve you for those bigger things. 
Wow, that's a great lesson. I think I'm thinking like your advice is gonna be go get a chainsaw, chop some. Trees. Yeah, well, that might not be for everyone because for some people it's like, yeah, that's not scary. But for yeah. me, it was like, yeah, and I hope no one like injures themselves from this podcast <laughs> disclaimer. That was just like uh, for Kat, that's what she needed yeah. to do. But <laughs> she just says, you know, say compliment to a stranger, or just start small, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. And it was such a lesson as well of the creative process because I got the chainsaw and then within five minutes it broke. It wouldn't start again. So then I'm like YouTubing how to fix this thing and I realized you're not supposed to put chainsaw through dirt and that's why it broke. So, okay, I get another chain and then it happens again and then I, I'm YouTubing and I, by the end, and it took me like two months to figure out how to use this thing properly. But by the end of it, I had gained such a mastery. And it was such a lesson of the creative process in that even though you feel connected and you feel aligned or you feel purpose towards something, usually the first time you put yourself out there, it's not going to land that well. It's going to look really messy, really... There's going to be face plants and mistakes and things that go wrong. But if it's aligned to your core, something that really compels you, you're going to be able to overcome each one of those little obstacles. And through that process, you're going to develop mastery. And that's what's going to make you super competent and super magnetic to other people. And I think that that is something else that a lot of us forget because online you tend to see people like, I just launched something and it just blew up or I have a million followers in two months. And we think that success or alignment means that you put yourself out there and right away things will flow magnetically, beautifully well. When really it's just like, it's, it looks so chaotic. It's so many blunders, but if it's aligned to your core, you'll be able to push through. If it's not, you'll you'll pivot you'll get bored you'll you'll get discouraged and i do think that that's why those obstacles show up is to to kind of like a litmus test to help us not go down the wrong road or to help us you know foster the the aptitudes and skills needed to receive down the road that we desire to be in yeah yeah that's wonderful um, I want to talk about silencing that voice inside of you. I feel like there's a lot of internal conversations happening, especially when you are not just around money, but when you're pivoting, you're in alignment, but there's chaos coming. Do you have those conversations in your head? Like, oh my God, that's such a stupid idea. Like, I can't believe you're doing this. Or it's like, a, can I? Of course you can. Or no, you can't. So how do you override those internal voices, even though... I think you talk about gnosis in your book and how to override subconscious, right? Um, but what is what what has been the process for you when you have those voices creeping up? Like I told you, you know what's happening again. So, do you have like a no go go to that corner? Like what is do you have like a go to strategy for that? Yeah. So those every time. I encounter an unknown, I encounter that voice. So it's super normal, first of all, and I don't think it ever truly goes away. Um, because it's just the, the way our brains are programmed. Our, our, our brains are programmed to keep us breathing and alive. And as far as the brain is concerned, where you are right now, what, whatever financial circumstances you have is just perfect because you're still breathing. You're still alive. So do not deviate. Do not do anything that's like out there. So the moment you step out of that into an unknown, you're always going to encounter that voice because it's trying to protect you. It has your best interest in heart. But unfortunately, our rational minds are only basing decisions off past observations, experiences, you know, things in the past. And it's not connected to the infinite probabilities that you have access to. That's what your intuition has access to, not your rational mind. So even though it has our best interests at heart, we, we can't listen to it. 
because it doesn't know all the probabilities, all the opportunities that are there for you. It doesn't know the unknown. It's never been there. That's why it's freaking out. And yes, sometimes it is so, so loud that it stunts me like fully and it keeps me inert and it keeps me stuck. So what I really love about the world of alchemy and one of the things that drew me into the world of magic was how alchemists will access the subconscious through altered states of consciousness called Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. And they do this through many, many ways. So one of the most popular methods in the world of alchemy is sex magic. Orgasm is an altered state of consciousness. You have breath work, you have meditation, you have psychedelics, you have cold plunges. There's thousands of ways to access these states. But essentially it's based off the understanding that the, 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 the subconscious is really what drives 95% of decision-making and behaviors and determines most of your resonance. But it's very difficult to access the subconscious or to affirm yourself from the rational conscious awareness space. You could sit there and say, I'm wealthy, I'm, I'm attracting love, I'm attracting all the money, and you could say this for hours on end every single day, and find yourself nowhere closer to where you want to be and still have that little voice in your mind going, yeah, right, because that little voice is in your subconscious. So in order to reprogram a lot of those beliefs or voices or fears, we got to start playing at that level as well. We got to leave the rational mind behind and we got to enter an altered state of consciousness and from there intentionally find the feeling space, find the vibration if you found the feeling space or the vibration, it means you found the perspective because all your feelings are determined by your thoughts. They're all a result of synaptic connections happening in the brain. So if you focus on the feeling of finding that feeling space inadvertently, that means you found the perspective or the vision or the idea. And you do this every single day, especially if you're in a really deep space of fear or disbelief or doubt. You do this every single day. You go and access an altered state of consciousness. You prioritize finding that frequency from that space. And gradually what you're going to find is that that voice will diminish. And that will happen very quickly, within a matter of weeks, actually, if you're very consistent with it every day. Within a matter of weeks, that voice is going to diminish. Not only that, the coolest thing about that is if you think about all your desires, so let's say you're trying to put out a new offer in your business or you want to put yourself out there for a new job, but you're really, really afraid. The desire for a new job or for a new clients or a new business, ultimately those always boil down to an expansion in your greens. You want those things because you're trying to feel a certain way. You're trying to feel more confident or more freedom or more play or more flow or more purpose so when you start to give yourself those states especially within that imprintable area of the subconscious what happens is that you no longer have this like huge pressure that's happening where like i have to do this i have to have this outcome I have to show up this way. I have to post on social media these things that are scaring me so much because you're giving yourself already what you ultimately want. So it releases a lot of the resistance that we bring to the table when we're trying to create. And then ultimately that allows you to actually connect with the, the way that you want to create based off your core instead of the ego and the pressure of like it needs to be this way or I should do it this way. If the fear is too great and you cannot transmute it, usually that's a sign it's not for you. You're barking up the wrong tree. So the first step is like be intentional in transmuting it and really connecting to those greens that you're ultimately aspiring to give yourself those greens. And then if you find you're still procrastinating, 
you still don't want to do this thing. You still cannot show up this way. It's probably not for you. That's literally your core is saying like, no go, no go. So there's like a two step dance that happens there because we want to make sure we don't just give up right away because it's super normal that we're going to encounter imposter syndrome, fear, doubt, anxiety, that little voice of like, oh, you failed here, you did this. The first step is always transmuting that and reconnecting to our greens. And then when we're connected to our greens in that way, if we try to approach that creation again and we meet all kinds of resistance, that is you telling yourself, like, this is not it. And you need to reimagine what that then looks like for you. So a lot of people, for example, they think they need to be posting or doing live videos or reels or, you know, doing X, Y, Z, getting on sales calls with people. And these things really, really freak them out. And there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of anxiety when really there's no condition, there's no right or wrong, there's no one strategy is how you're gonna succeed. Any and all strategies can work. I mean, you name it, you'll find an example of somebody who's done it, you know? That's the brilliant thing. It's like anything can work just like anything can fail. And you get to follow and reimagine those structures that really feel good and match with what it is that you desire for yourself. Wow. You know, when you were explaining desire, especially in the book as well, it, it comes back over and over. Like we have to, by the way, you guys need to go and read the book, get the book, but it comes back to you listing out your desires and a lot of the times you were saying that you wanted something, you got it, and you realized you don't want that. So what's the situation there? Because that's not for you, but you still got it anyway. Yeah, so that's why it's better to make our desires rooted in the greens, the emotional states that we aspire to. Because a lot of the times the ego will chase something I want this kind of relationship, or I want this. And then you get it and you're like, oh, no, this is not what I thought, right? I didn't, it wasn't exactly what I wanted. So it's always better to take our desires back to the greens of what we want. And also, it's important to re remember that this is, the, this is the transformation phase. We're here to continuously transform and to continuously grow. So I remember when I was a freelancer, I was like, I just want to make 5K a month and then I'll be so happy and I'll never ask for anything else in the world. And I made 5K a month. And do you think I never asked for anything else? Do you think I was like super happy? I was like, well, no, now I want 10K and I, and I want more time. And then I got 10K and I was like, well, now I want a big team. And I, so they're all stepping stones and they all allow us to go to the highest expression of ourselves. And we tend to continuously evolve from them. Each one of them is like a learning lesson for us that we optimize, if you will. And we're like, okay, Yes, this person was great, but I wasn't specific enough. I want them to be happy. You know, I asked for a really nice, caring man, but he wasn't happy. Oh, damn. Okay, we got to go back to the drawing board because now I realize that's really important to me. So when we stick to the greens, when we make our desires rooted in greens, usually that minimizes a lot of that and it accelerates the pace at which we attract and transform ourselves. Because ultimately what you're after through a new partner or a new venture or a new job is a sense of love or well-being or confidence. So stick to that and usually you'll attract those things that are just perfect for you. And oftentimes, they're not at all what you thought rationally that you wanted or even connected with in your mind. And they come into your life and you're like, oh my God, this is like 10 times better than what I could even dream for myself. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I want to talk about receiving as well, because when we desire and we finally get it, in the book as well, you mentioned receiving. Why do we suck at receiving? Like what's, what's happening there? Why some people yeah. are so bad? What do you think? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of these paradigms around it's not fair to receive if other people don't. Um, a lot of guilt of, of receiving. There's a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves where we think, say, you, you land a $10,000 client. Let's say it's your highest paying client yet. One of the things that I often observed in myself was I would land these clients, they would buy, and then I would immediately feel like, oh, I have to give more. Like I, I need to do more work for them. I need to, yeah, and that would inadvertently cock block, so to speak, future 10K clients coming in because it was like I felt, I felt like I wasn't deserving of that. So yeah, I think it all comes down to a space of, of deserving. And it's funny because we can be really good in terms of having affinity to money, feeling really positive about money. We can feel really good about outflows and how we spend our money, which is a big part of the equation. But then we'll receive money and we're either frustrated, it's not enough, or it's so much that we're like, we don't know how to be comfortable with that sum of money. We don't know how to feel deserving. And one of the things that I just want to reiterate here is that you are money. It's, it's you. It's an imagined thing. It doesn't exist in nature, anywhere in nature. Money only exists in the human mind. So you are money. You are a dollar. You are $10,000. You are a million dollars. You are a billion dollars. There's literally zero separation between you and those sums of money. But I think because of how we're all raised in the society where it's seen as this separate thing, like almost like this force on its own, like money is like this thing that we got to work and sacrifice really, really hard. And when we receive it, especially when we receive it with ease, where we haven't had to sacrifice, so people will get inheritances or they'll win money and then they like they they don't they don't know how to receive that they feel really guilty or ashamed of it cuz they didn't go and bleed themselves out for it right we feel like oh i cannot receive this and ultimately we'll repel that money away we'll prevent ourselves from receiving more so that is really about teaching yourself that you're you're the money just as you are there's actually zero separation to it and being intentional in celebrating money coming in really helps with this especially money that came in really easily with little effort so a lot of times we will celebrate the money that we really struggled for yay and we should celebrate that too but you know if somebody gives us money or we just got a client and we didn't really do much. It was like one, one on call, one on call for, for 10 K. And we're like, Oh, you know, that's, that's too easy. I didn't deserve that. But that's the type of money that we should be really intentional in celebrating the, the really easy fluid money that we receive. So you create rituals around celebrating it. You like sometimes I'll do a dance. I create money maps a lot that help me to every day track my money. And every time a sum comes in, even if it's like $15, I'm like, yay, thank you. I say thanks to my dragon. Sometimes I'll do a little dance or jimmy or I'll ring a singing bowl. Uh, you just create these little moments within your life where you appreciate and you feel gratitude for the money coming in. And the more you do this and the more you make this a habit, the easier it will become for you to receive more, the more you'll receive and the more you'll, it'll counter the whole deserving thing rather than trying to attack like, am I deserving of this? Like, and then you're going through like childhood traumas in your past of what people said to you or like a fortune teller told you, you know, you, uh, it's so convoluted. You just literally engage the divine masculine your actions your behaviors your words to acknowledge and appreciate and celebrate money coming in and that will naturally put you in the space of of deservingness yeah i love that you talk about the dragon the money dragon in the book as well that's such a beautiful way to describe money 
Can you tell us like how that came to you to kind of give that form, like physical form for money for us to imagine and celebrate rather than see it as something bad or that we resent? Yeah, so I went left field with money magic because I include like a whole story about a dragon in there. And but to me, it's been such a game changer. I was in a period in my life where I did feel resentful for money. I was out of affinity with it because I blamed it for the mental breakdown that I'd had. I, I, I blamed my pursuit of money for the reason why I had almost killed myself. And so I started to get all these weird dragon synchronicities showing up in my life, just random threads here and there. And my daughter was watching a movie one day about called The Wish Dragon. And this dragon came up on screen and it was like this really playful character that was dropping these bad dad jokes. And I connected with this idea of let me connect this personality to my money because the the personality I was ascribing to money at that point was one of just bad it was like the problems of society I was very resentful towards it I was very much like oh I'm angry with money and I was telling all my clients at the time like stop chasing money I mean we shouldn't chase money I still believe that but I was definitely like averse to to money as a whole concept but i was really fed up with my 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 financial circumstances at the time i was clearly desiring for for more money even though i was resenting it because i was comparing myself to my last business going what am i doing wrong why isn't the money coming as easily this time so it was very hypocritical of me i was resentful of it but i was secretly wanting more And so I decided to play around with this idea of connecting my money to this dragon. And things changed so quickly for me. And I didn't think it, I, I thought it was just me and my weird brain at the time. Like, okay, this is really weird. But then I did my first Money Magic workshop in 2022. And I kind of brought up the dragon in passing. Like, I literally just said a few sentences like, oh, I connected my money to a dragon not really thinking much of it just to try to help people and people just loved it like they just like immediately were like oh i get it now if i ascribe a personality to money that feels good playful loving loyal that has the capacity for flames but also the capacity for tremendous treasure it's easier for me to begin to build affinity with this this imagined resource so it just took off like wildfire and that was kind of how the dragon got born yeah i love that i think it's beautiful you know and, it's, and it, it is a fun character the dragon it's blessing you it's everywhere i love love that okay so again the book i think the writing was phenomenal and this is your second book right after the flow protocols Um, yeah, magic source codes. Yeah. Yes, this is your second book. Uh, how was the process of writing the second book versus the first one? The same. Very different. <laughs> <laughs> the first one I wrote within two weeks. Um, I was in a really chaotic space, which I talk about in Money Magic, how that first book came about. And I just was like, you know what, I'm going to follow my flow. And I came, I, I tapped into some courage and then suddenly like the book just downloaded in me and it was live within, it, not live, but it was written within two weeks. There's still the editing and all that process that needed to happen. But I had the first manuscript within two weeks. Money Magic was a totally different experience. I had transcribed my Money Magic workshop right after I did the, the first workshop in 2022. So technically I had the first manuscript that I just needed to go through and, and clean up, but I wasn't connecting to it. Like there was something that just wasn't connecting. So it, it was, it took me almost a year to write Money Magic versus like the two, two weeks with Magic Source Codes. And 
the reason, like I can see now how the reason why I wasn't fully connecting to it was because there was still so many codes that I needed to receive in my life that needed to go into the book and that were not in the first Money Magic Workshop. There were structures in my life that I was not aligned with. There were things in my life that I needed to pattern interrupt, that I needed to navigate my way through. And as I was not allowing myself to receive this creation and connect with it with deep purpose until I connected to deep purpose first and foremost. And that meant that I had to pattern interrupt some things. I had to align my actions to my intentions, which took me a minute to get to. And also the, the, the whole narrative around the dragon wasn't in the first manuscript. And I really encountered massive imposter syndrome with this book because I went left field with it. And it, I delayed releasing it for so long, even though I pre-sold copies, people had bought. I was like, I can't, I can't do this. I had this voice in my head, like it's too weird, cat. People are, it's just so strange. Like, so I really had to like sit with that, transmute that again, go into acts of courage in my life, like start at the basics, fix my frequency, prioritize that. And then, um, when I did that, it was just like, okay, here it is. <laughs> yeah. And I'm so glad yeah. that you released it. You grabbed your chainsaw, like, here we go. <laughs> I'll have courage now. Let's go. No, I'm so glad you did it because um, right from the beginning, and it's, and I'm sorry for butchering your first book title, by the way. <laughs> just That's okay. <laughs> it's late. It's midnight, okay? Um, oh, but um, so as I was reading the, the first just as it begins, it sucks me in. I know it's like your stripper stories, but it's just the way you write. I'm like hooked and like I want more. I'm like an addict. That's how I felt about that raw, oh. authentic expression of yours. And I need more like that, you know? And obviously, you kind of, the way you've written it, like you guys need to read it, but it's probably going to be like addictive for you guys to read it as well. But uh, I love how you kind of went into your... You're, it's it's such a beautiful expression, like artistic expression as well, you know, like almost how you even talk about the dragon and then it, it kind of comes back to reality, like, okay, so here's what you do, like, um, so it's, it's such a dance between those, like, not weird, but it's such an, a beautiful expression and then it goes to, like, okay, so here, back to rationality, so, you know, and you talk about, you know, obviously, like, histories and, like, um, desires and all of that, but then you come yeah. back to this, like, artsy form again, and it's such a beautiful way, and I love that, I want more, I'm like, that's amazing, that's what I love the most, honestly. Oh, thank you, that means a lot to me. I love reading nonfiction and I love reading mindset books, but one of the things I really struggle with, with a lot of them is it's too much like the how to, the practical, and then I, my brain kind of like zones out. Whereas, I don't know if you ever read The Alchemist, and they don't, it, that book doesn't really go into the practical guide, but it, it, it's full story but it just like pulls you in. You're like, mm -hmm. and that's why I, and, and story is the most powerful thing on this planet. It, it, it creates wars. It creates, you know, everything we do is to tell stories. The biggest amalgamation of human groups on this planet is based off stories, you know, Hinduism, Catholicism, religion, right? Those are all stories that we shared and we passed on again and again. And it is the most powerful thing. So I really wanted to tell a story um, more than anything else and then have a practical guide of like, okay, here's how this plays out in real life. So yeah, it makes me so happy to hear no, it's that really, it I'm so happy it's you. out. And honestly, if you've ever written a book about the stripper times or like agency times or like like what 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 had went on behind the scenes that you never share like I'll be so interested to just read it like Kat's biography but in like in this in the same manner that you wrote this that would be so interesting for me too 
to like yeah i'm working on two more right now so i've got two books that are like it's just like once i release the author which was like this lifelong dream of mine publish two books in one year which is wild for me to think because it's taken me 37 years to get to this point um but now it's like it it's just connecting so easily and it's just flowing and I still have writer's block I still have those moments of imposter that's not I think ever really going to go away but it's it's such a a reminder of the process of when we connect to our desires and we give ourselves to permission to pursue them and create in that direction everything comes together you know the pieces that need to support that you attract and you you become magnetic to those people that will resonate to that yeah yeah well i'm excited to see those two books that are going to come out soon yeah. uh, again i know you're mentoring entrepreneurs on money on mindset so whoever is listening to this podcast you know please hit up cat you know she has the coven she has many programs the flow protocol podcast and of course the money magic book and the magic source codes yes i did not butcher that for next time thank you so much for your time cat <laughs> thank you so much for having me such a pleasure <laughs>